Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Area Chats. I'm your host, Paul Brogan, and it's great to be back with all of you. We're all about everything in the greater Concord area and the surrounding towns, the people, places, things, all of the things that make it a really fascinating and interesting place to make our lives. Today is about some of that. And I will quickly say before I introduce our guest, one of the joys of writing my books was the fact to share some of the experiences and background and history of this great community because it is endlessly fascinating and people are really curious to find out what it was about. Well, today's guest has taken it one step further. She's an outstanding author. Kathleen Bailey has written every kind of book. In fact, she was on the show last year. We talked about her book on New Hampshire War Monuments, and it was a fascinating discussion. Today, we're going to talk about her upcoming release, Growing Up in Concord. It'll be out in July, although it's available for pre-order now, and you can contact Gibson's and get a copy of it prior to her doing an event there on Thursday, July 6th, at 6.30 in the evening, I'm going to be there. And I would like to see everyone who has an interest in Concord pack into Gibson's that night. Because I swear it will be more explosive than the 4th of July two days earlier. So, I want to welcome now, two hours after starting the introduction, Kathleen Bailey. <laughs> it's great to have you that back. That was your best intro ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I wanted to do you justice. The intro I did a month ago at our author event at the Bank of New Hampshire stage, I was sort of limited to about 30 seconds because of you know the evening and the way it yeah. was set up. So I said, I'm going to make up for it because this is my show and I can say whatever I want. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. It's really good to have you here. And uh, like, uh, I was speechless for a moment, oh my god. Um, <laughs> Like everyone else, I think, and you really have put, what, a year and a half of your life into this new book? Yes, about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Because you, you talked with me a good year ago, I think, yeah. that we had about an hour and we probably could have gone on for six or eight. Yeah. But you talked with, what, about a hundred individuals? Uh, 30 in-depth okay. interviews. Mm -hmm of a minimum of an hour each. Mm -hmm. And then there were briefer interviews with people about specific topics. But the core of the book is my one hour interviews with baby boomers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I tried to do was kind of like a Ken Burns thing. Yes. Where you know, if he's doing a Vietnam film, he picks out five to ten veterans and he'll interview them about being drafted and then he'll circle back, do you remember the Tet Offensive? Circle back, do you remember the fall of Saigon? Mm -hmm. And he keeps circling back to the same people and getting their perspective. So that was what I tried to do with my in-depth interviews. I would ask them about their neighborhood, and then I'd circle back and ask them about school, mm -hmm. about what they did for entertainment and fun. I got some really good stuff there. Fortunately, <laughs> the statute of limitations has expired. <laughs> uh, going downtown or down street, down as street, you we kindly it. remind yes. me. And then I did smaller interviews with people on specific topics, mm -hmm. like Deborah Giles Lincoln, I would talk to her about the Nevers Band specifically. But I probably talked to 50 people in total. Mm -hmm. Wow. You had a wealth of stories then for certain, I'm sure. I have the most amazing stories. I've got what really happened at the quarry. I've got Fred Walker's <laughs> duck story, <laughs> which I do not tell as well as he does. Of course but... not, no. <clears throat> yeah. And when, as you wrote, as you listened to the stories and began to formulate you know, exactly how you were going to do it, did your 
feelings about growing up in the community evolve or change at all as you heard all of these stories? Um, it solidified what I felt about Concord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've always taken a piece of Concord <clears throat> with me wherever I've been mm -hmm. and whatever I've been doing. Um, as Hemingway said about Paris, Concord is a movable feast. <laughs> I don't go to class reunions. I have no ax to grind. I have no broken heart to mm -hmm. avenge. I don't care that they know that I'm not a dork anymore. But I still keep coming around to Concord. Mm -hmm. How did this part of it influence me? How did that part of it influence me? Growing up, isn't linear. Mm -hmm. It's circular. Mm -hmm. And you keep coming back to where you were formed to help you make sense of it. So it's true. like Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Yes. Dawn, go away. You can't leave the places where you were born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. Absolutely true. And I think that uh, it really, I wonder sometimes that other communities make as deep an impression upon the people that grew up there as Concord seemed to. Because I've talked to so many dozens of people in the years, and they all have such vivid memories of particular moments in time. And for instance, the Bicentennial Parade. Uh, people remember that as the greatest parade they'd ever been to. And I think in many ways it was. I mean, there were something like 20 or 25,000 people showed up for it. They were eight and 10 deep on the sidewalks. And there was an energy about our bicentennial that I think involved everyone, whether you were six years old or eight years old or 80 or 90. And well, Paul, in my book, I touch on the, I have a whole chapter on the bicentennial, mm -hmm. actually. And I agree with what you're, you were saying. It's actually the last time we came together as a community mm -hmm. before Vietnam. Yes. There was still an innocence. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That was left over from the post-World War II era and the Eisenhower yeah. years where things flourished and yeah. there was a sense of... We would come together again but it would be for things like Christian McAuliffe's death mm -hmm, or 911. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I think that was the last time we came together for innocent small town fun. Yes, yes. And there, and there was. There was just a revelry, but it was a fun kind. You know, nobody yeah. was really pushing the envelope too much. They were just delighting in the fact that. You know, we're putting the time capsule in the ground and, uh, you know, we're all together and yeah. they're putting on this great, I think the parade was about an hour and a half long or something because yeah. it, it truly... You were on the library floor. Yes, the Friends of the Public Library wearing the earphones from the listening room, <laughs> the Ruth May listening room that had just opened downstairs. And um, my father was president of the Friends of the Library, so uh, I was recruited. Um, I was told I was going to be on the float, but it was exciting, it was fun, and it just seemed to go on forever. You know, it, it was an instance of saying our parades are as good as the Macy's, you know, Thanksgiving Day yeah. parade or anything like that. We're really putting on something special. Yeah, there was a lot of small town civic pride, mm -hmm. and make no mistake, we were called a city, but we were a big town. We were. So true. We were not a city. <clears throat> no. You ran into Mayor Davy downtown or, you know, hi, how are you? And, you know. Yeah, and we all had basically the same culture. We did. We did. We wore the same clothes. Mm -hmm. We listened to the same records. Mm -hmm. Remember records. Yes. Um, Headed to the community center often yeah. on Friday night for the dance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody. We may have had first-generation parents who practiced their ethnic traditions at home. Mm -hmm. But when we were out in the community, we were pretty much all alike. Mm -hmm. And we felt very safe. 
I don't think you ever gave a thought when you were walking, you know, out at 10 or 11 at night, if you were coming back oh, from someplace. Definitely not. You never thought. I know 14 years old, walking home from the Concord Theater at 11 o'clock at night. And Paul, yes. look at where we were living. Yes. The state hospital was running yes. at full strength. The state prison was running at yes. full st strength. There were no halfway houses. No. There was no community-based mental health care. No. Uh, state legislators, don't get me started on them. <laughs> But we still felt safe. We did. We felt Walter Carlson was going to keep us. Do you remember the sign that they had for a while out in front of the state house saying how many days it had been since there had been a violent crime in Concord? Um, and that meant uh, a, a bar fight coming out of Carl <laughs> a bar Car fight. Uh, Carlin's Cafe or something. That was our definition of a violent crime. Yes. A bar fight. A bar fight. And at one point, we were over 400 days since there had been, you know, not a traffic citation or parking, but a violent crime. You know, somebody uh, bullying somebody and taking a punch. And it was just months and months where you would see this sign out there. Yeah. And I remember a, friend, a family would come to visit us when I was a child, and we'd take them down to the state house, and they'd see that sign, and they'd say, is that true? And we'd say, yeah, that's just the way it is. And we thought, oh, well, every community must have a sign, you know, touting how long it had been since. And Carlin's got pretty wild. I mean, my mother, would, it, when we were real little, coming into Concord, if we, you know, were stopping at Angelo's, she would tell us, don't look across the street at Carlin's, uh, because there'd be people on the step sometimes. And, She'd say, that's a flop house, and my children shouldn't be seeing that. So. <laughs> but uh, well, you cover Carlin's, I'm sure. Oh, I do. Oh, okay. Carlin's, I guess. Some people say Carlin's, some say Carlin. It's like White's Park. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the last time we were here, we were talking about your New Hampshire War Monument book, which I have read and loved. You gave such a richness in detail without just making it uh, something that you'd look up on Wikipedia or you would look up you know, in a dictionary to find out about. You made it very personal as far as the stories behind it. And your daughter has played an integral part in that book and your Exeter book, of course, and your upcoming Concord book. And what's it like uh, as a team? How do you balance uh, what you do? Well, whenever I need a contemporary photo, I <laughs> ask her to take it. And it was pretty easy for the Concord book. I, she lives here, too, so mm -hmm. I didn't need to go with her. I just say, I need something of the old Capitol Shopping Center, mm -hmm or I need something of a market basket, and mm -hmm. she would mostly go out and do it herself. Mm -hmm. But when we did war monuments, we spent a lot of time on the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would team up and go to these places together, get lost. Mm -hmm. um, one time, we were in Plainfield looking for a cemetery, and we drove around and around and around for three hours. Mm -hmm. Turns out we were going right by it, but it didn't have a sign. Mm -hmm. So never get lost in Plainfield. No. <laughs> well, I love the book, and I love the fact that Senator Hassan wrote the foreword for it. And um, I'm, I'm sure that that must have been wonderful to have her uh, um, you know, write that. I was thrilled. I knew Maggie when she was a lawyer in Exeter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we go back a ways. Mm -hmm. Well, you have quite a career in journalism. I mean, that goes back quite a few years. And when you were a journalist, did you have in the back of your mind a thought that, gee, someday I would like to write a book? I wanted to write a book since I was six years old. Wow. I could read when I was four. Mm -hmm. And one of the series that I loved was 
called Betsy, Tacy, and Tib. It was about these three little girls that lived in Minnesota uh -huh. around the turn of the century. It was kind of like Little House on the Prairie, mm -hmm. only in a small town. But mm -hmm. the Betsy one was a writer. Mm -hmm. And oh. she was always climbing up to her tree house and scribbling stories in a five cent notebook. Mm -hmm. So I figured if she could do it, I could do it. And then the stunning blow that really changed my life was sixth grade when one of my friends brought me a copy of A Wrinkle in Time. Mm. And she said, everybody's reading this, you gotta read this. It was the first time in my life somebody had ever said, you've got to read this. Mm -hmm. I read it and I thought, wow, words can do this? Well, you have certainly written a variety of, of, of you know, genres. And what is your favorite? I love them all in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love my Christian historical fiction. I love using that as a way to express my faith. Mm -hmm. And everybody loves a good romance, and yes. everybody loves history. Yes. But I have to say that the Arcadia books mm -hmm. made me fall in love with nonfiction mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. And that was a total surprise. Mm -hmm. The Exeter book, not so much. The Exeter book was, you get a historic picture, you get a contemporary picture of what's in the same spot. Exactly. And you write a cut line that goes between them, kind of paint by numbering. Mm -hmm. And then War Monuments was different. War Monuments totally engaged me. And I got really caught up in telling real people's stories. Mm -hmm. Well, it's obvious in reading it because um, it, it just makes you understand and celebrate the monument and what it represents and stands for because it, it, it just brings it to life and it makes you want to know more and it makes you want to get in the car actually and go out and actually stand there in front of it. Well actually Paul if this book has any more traction mm -hmm. I'm probably going to craft some suggested routes for mm. monument tours oh. along with places to eat because yes. I like to eat out so I know absolutely, a lot of places. Absolutely, absolutely. So I thought of crafting some little <laughs> tours and printing them out and just distributing them. Oh, how fun. I, yeah. That would be. Oh, absolutely. But the the book, the stories just stunned me, like the five Manchester guardsmen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That blew me away, and mm -hmm. that the state's largest city was brought to its knees one hot August afternoon to respect and honor five of their own. Yes. That's why I dedicated the book to the guardsmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful book. And, and speaking of your touring thing, okay, where would you suggest somebody eat in Plainfield? Mm. Yeah. I'd cross over to Windsor and go to Windsor Station, actually. But uh, we, because. After all that driving around, we just went to a McDonald's or Did something. Did you? Okay. Yeah, because we but were tired. You just crossed that beautiful covered bridge. I think yeah. it's supposedly the longest one or something. And on the other side, Windsor, there's the wonderful Windsor Station. And they make their homemade popovers that are about this big. Well, and if I ever go up <clears throat> that way again, <throat> I will do that. <clears throat> But uh, now, just talking about the book makes me want to pick it up and read it again, so I have no doubt that I will probably do that. Uh, now, back to the Concord book. Oh, please. Um, I am just so excited because I love our community, but I also uh, know just from reading your monument book that you're going to bring it alive in a totally different way and that... Uh, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that it's going to be um, a book that is going to set a standard for how a book about 
a, a time and a place, and growing up in that time and place will be you know, it, the it's standard. It's really interesting. I have discovered so many things on this journey, and it mm -hmm. has been a journey, mm -hmm. because I walked into it, of course, thinking I knew everything. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of lessons and a lot of reflection. For example, Concord in the 50s was not always good to the gay, the black, the poor. Yes. But when I talked to people, nobody hated Concord. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They would hate what the world was doing. Yes. And they would hate what society was doing. Mm -hmm. But they somehow <clears throat> managed to separate that <clears throat> excuse me. from yes. the mm -hmm. town itself. And that was amazing to me. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I noted was the war. Mm -hmm. Because there was kind of a dichotomy between our fathers and sometimes our mothers who served and what they brought back mm -hmm. from the war. The war was all around us. Yes. Um, one of my neighbors had his leg shot off and he had an artificial leg. Um, one of my other neighbors had one eye. You mm -hmm. couldn't help mm -hmm. seeing it. It was all around us. The VFW was flourishing. The DAV was mm -hmm. flourishing. The Legion. Yeah. T today, guys do not go to clubs. They go to therapists. Right. Yes. Which might be better for them in the long run. <laughs> but it was all around us, and yet they didn't want to talk about it. No. No. Except maybe to their buddy after they'd had yeah, a drink or but, two. But they didn't tell <laughs> us. No. I was an adult before mm -hmm. I knew the full extent of what happened in the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We read the diary of Anne Frank, right. but we stopped mm -hmm. before the people came up the stairs to arrest her. Mm -hmm. We planted a tree in Israel, but we had no idea why we were planting a tree in mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. We were protected from some of the harshest realities yes. because Huntley and Brinkley didn't necessarily, you know, uh, or Walter Cronkite. Uh, give the brutality of everything. But or, that was why Vietnam was such yes, a shock. Yes, yeah, because that really. Because by then, everything was in your living room? Yes, it was. Mm. Yes, it was. But it was. As far as World War II, our parents may have watched the Nuremberg trials, but they did it after they put us to bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, that was a whole dichotomy that I uncovered mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, it was very, I mean, what I heard about, mom in the summertime went out and worked at the Hollywood Canteen, and she talked about, you know, that. And that was a much different, safer side of, of the war part. My father never talked about being in the Air Force, except that he met my mother at the Hollywood Canteen. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but you didn't really get the brutality of the missions he flew and the things that he saw and all of that. And she painted this much rosier picture that was represented in the movies too by, you know, the Hollywood canteen. And because that kind of they thing. had to. Yes, if they to looked, cope with it, yes. If they looked at what they were really going mm -hmm. through and what they were sending their mm -hmm. men and women off to, they couldn't have borne it. No, no, no. And there was no, uh, and you couldn't really seek therapy or psychiatric help then uh, because, again, the state hospital, the reputation, people would say the population of Concord is 28,000, not counting the 2,000 people at the state hospital. And there was a, nobody would have talked about therapy. Yeah. There was no river bend or anything. We are running out of time, which means that. I'm going to have to invite you back, which I shall do, because I think we have plenty more to talk well, about. Well, let's, let's see if we can find something else I know about first. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank Kathleen Bailey, the author of the upcoming book, Growing Up in Concord, 
get to Gibson's, go on their website, um, definitely pre-order it, and show up in force on Thursday evening, July the 6th at 6.30 p.m. to hear her talk about the book, maybe do a reading, sign copies of the book, and just enjoy being around a lot of people who love Concord as much as Kathleen and I do. She will be back, I promise, again, because um, she's a delight to talk about, and she's a bright, delightful, charming, intelligent, talented, gifted human being. Um, so thank you, Kathleen. And please thank your daughter for all she has done to contribute toward your last few books in particular. And I want to thank all of you out there. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching the show. Uh, thank you to Matt. Thank you to the folks here at Concord TV. It's a joy and a thrill as I begin my sixth year doing the show to be able to talk with some of the great people in our area. So until next time, this is your host, Paul Brogan, saying thank you and goodbye.